forward to sharing one more story with you. From my favorite book, The Journey Home, Autobiography of an American Swami. I know some of you have read it. Yes. Some of you have probably met him, Ragnar Swami. It's an incredible book. It tells, of course, the story of his life. And the main focus of the book is a journey that he took when he was only 19 years old. And he was a young Jewish American boy who grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. And he went on what started out as a summer vacation between semesters with his friends. And it very quickly turned into a spiritual quest. He felt a calling to go to India. And he was in Europe, penniless, so he hitchhiked all the way through Europe and the Middle East. He ended up in India, and along the way had many incredible experiences meeting great saints like Ananda Mahima, having a lot of his own very profound experiences like the one you're about to hear. And all the while he was looking for his own mantra, his own teacher, and his own spiritual path. So he was meeting all these different teachers from different traditions. Really feeling this burning desire to find his own teacher. And of course, ultimately, he did. He found his mantra, he found his teacher, and he found his own spiritual path, the path of Bhakti Yoga. And in this book, he shares what he learned along the way. So this part of the book, he's in India, and he finds himself in Goa, where he went to recover his health after a great sickness. And Goa is famous for its beaches, so of course it's full of tourists. Famous for very beautiful white sands. Arriving at the beachfront, I saw stretches of white sands, crystal seas and scores of coconut trees. To pass the time, I traveled to Kamangunta Beach, a haven for Westerners who rented inexpensive houses there. Walking the beach, I passed men and women kissing and groping each other, heard rock and roll blaring, and saw drugs openly consumed. It was the same old scene I had left behind in Europe, but it now seemed so alien, like something from a past life. Uninterested, I walked through the sand along the sea. I caught myself mentally criticizing them, as if I were superior. I didn't want these thoughts, which exposed my own arrogance. I prayed to be purified from my own pollution of fault finding. But it was so hard. Living with the animals in the jungles was so much easier as they didn't so thoroughly expose my own shortcomings. About a kilometer further, I came upon drug addicts, all from the west, scattered along the seashore, sticking needles in their arms. They had come so far, to one of the most beautiful places on earth, only to suffer the miseries of addiction. Quickening my pace, I arrived at a small mountain at the end of the beach. I climbed over its boulders, panting in exhaustion, until I reached the other side. There, a tropical paradise lay before me. This would be my home for the next week. One day, I took a walk in land. There, nestled in coconut trees, I found a few scattered huts made of mud and dry coconut leaves, all built on the sand. The inhabitants, most of whom had converted to Christianity, followed the tradition of their ancestors as fishermen, with no assets but a rowboat, two oars, and a net. From sunrise to sunset, the men labored in the sea under the burning sun which blotched many of their faces with what looked like skin cancer. 
but hard work left them no time to dwell on such details. I thought how Jesus had made his first disciples from among fishermen, and then ordered them to be fishers of men. On another day, as I was walking along the coastline, I found a tiny fish flapping desperately in the sand. A wave had washed it ashore. The fish's fear and desperation evoked my sympathy. He and I were not so different after all, and I resolved to return him to his home in the sea. But each time I picked him up, he frantically flapped right out of my hand, so fearful he couldn't recognize me as a friend. Finally, I trapped him in my cupped hands and hurled him back into the water. Still, my sense of satisfaction was short-lived. The next wave washed onto the shore and receded back into the sea, leaving the same little fish once again flapping desperately in the sand. Again, I cast him into the water and again the next wave left him in the sand to die. The next time, with much difficulty, I held him inside my cupped palms tread into the ocean up to my neck and then hold him in as far as I could. I returned to the shore and observed wave after wave washing in and out until I was satisfied that the little fish was safe. Walking some distance, I came upon a group of fishermen dragging a net from their boat onto the sand. The net was filled with hundreds of such little fish, flapping for life and doomed to the frying pan. What could I do? I stared soberly into the sea and walked by immersed in thought. We are all like fish that have separated from the sea of divine consciousness. For a person to be happy outside his or her natural relation with God is like a fish trying to enjoy life outside of the water on the dry sand. Holy people go to great extremes to help even one person return to his or her natural spiritual consciousness, to the sea of true joy. But the net of Maya, or illusion, snatches away the minds of the masses, diverting us from our true self-interest.
can delete all your karma, all your bad karma. Can you believe? Chanting impurity, yes. But still, you can't believe how powerful this chanting is. It's, you can't imagine.
Hare 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 Hare